Hi class, welcome to lesson number 27. Uh, before I start jumping into the rest of the microeconomic stuff, I just want to recap the homework question from last time. I believe the question was to go over the four characteristics of oligopoly. So let me just review them real quick, okay? First one is a few large producers. Again, oligopoly is really sort of generic in the way it says it. Uh, a good example uh, in classes would be the big three in the automobile industry. Um, or let's say the um, oil uh, industry where you have a couple countries in the Middle East that control the majority of the oil. So think about it. Uh, we talked a little bit about the concentration ratio to help you out. Um, the ratio again was about 40%. If four companies have 40% or more of the market, we consider that as an oligopoly. Again, kind of generic. So don't worry if you can't figure that one out too specifically but understand that it's a few large producers, okay? The other one is the product has to be differentiated or, or standardized, right? It can be uh, like oil we talked about, pretty pretty um, standard, right? Or you can talk about cars, right? Extremely differentiated segment, okay? Um, third one is the entry barriers. Of course, there are some, right? They have to do their best, these, these large producers, in making sure that small companies don't take over, right? So the barriers to entry are there and oftentimes created by these large guys in the industry. And the last one is mutual interdependence, okay? This is because of the fact that because there are a few large producers, right? Pricing is very much dependent on the other one. If I, the big man, if I, if I am Ford, right? And I all of a sudden say that I'm gonna charge half as much for a car as does Chrysler or GM, obviously people are gonna start running to me, right? So it's, there's a mutual interdependence between these companies, okay? And oftentimes this is what leads to a concept called the cartel, right? I'm sure you've heard of it before. Uh, oftentimes, probably in a, not in a good sense in movies, you've heard of drug cartels. Um, we're not going to go into drug cartels in this class, but what, what I'm talking about is basically the word cartel, right? The word cartel basically says that we are an organized group of companies, right? We understand that we dominate the sector. Let's come together and let's take care of profits together, okay? So their cartel's goal is to maximize profits as a whole. Obviously, it's illegal, okay? It's not allowed, all right? But they still exist, okay? The oil cartel, in my opinion, is probably one of the most famous examples, right? They make sure that um, countries are producing and selling oil, right? Barrels of oil at a particular rate, okay? This is how they get to control the market as a whole, all right? So that being said, um, I want to move on to a new concept called the marginal revenue product of labor, okay? Marginal Revenue Product of Labor, known as MRPL, okay? So what is this MRPL, Marginal Revenue Product of Labor? What is that, okay? Let me write the, the expanded form as well, just to make sure that we're okay. Um, oftentimes, why, why do we use Marginal Revenue Product of Labor? It is designed so that employers know, right, when they hire excuse me, let me just finish this up, product of labor. All right, so let's uh, define marginal revenue product of labor. Um, so many words, so let's try to just put that into letters, right? So the way we define it is M-R-P-L, right? Marginal re revenue product of labor, okay? Now, I've talked a little bit about this before, but like, why is this important? Because when we add a unit of labor, okay, like any firm, okay, let's let's take Ford, okay, they're gonna add a new employee. They're they're thinking, is this employee worth it? Is adding that one unit of labor important, right? So the way we break down marginal revenue product of labor, okay, is into two parts, okay. This is calculated using First part is marginal product of labor, MPL. I hope you guys remember that, right? We've seen that before. And then of course, marginal revenue, also something which all of you have seen before, okay? So using these two parts, we come up with marginal revenue product of labor, okay? So um, let's go ahead and let's actually write down the formula for MRPL, okay? So marginal revenue product of labor, is defined as the following. It's defined as the change in total revenue, right? In TR, just total revenue, okay? Over the change in resource quantity, okay? In resource 
quantity, as in Q, okay? But again, a lot of words, what, what does this mean actually mathematically, right? So in, in short, what we do is we put in these two terms into the numerator and denominator, okay? So how that's going to look is it's going to say that MRPL is equivalent to marginal revenue, okay, times MPL, marginal product of labor, over the price times marginal product of labor. All right? So, you know, obviously you guys can just take the MPL out and it's going to be marginal revenue over price, okay? But oftentimes, using a table or a chart, you should be able to calculate this figure, okay? But I'm just breaking it down just in case if you guys wanted to know a little bit more about it, okay? Now, using this MRPL, we, we're going to understand a little more about profits and the way profits work in the labor market, okay? Oftentimes, till now, we've talked about how we made profits in the, uh, in the product market. Now we're going to talk about the labor market, okay? So let me go ahead and erase this part, and let's start off with um, talking about profits, okay? So profits, normally the way we've talked about profits in, in microecon before is simple, right? We had this one rule. We had said marginal cost should equal marginal benefit, okay? If this happens, we have maximized our profits, all right? Now, it's the same concept, but we add a little more about, when it comes to labor market, we add a little more terms, okay? So the way that marginal benefit or marginal cost come down to in the labor market is the following. Marginal cost, okay, becomes MRC, also known as marginal resource cost, okay? This is resource cost. Uh, marginal resource cost, okay. So resource, everyone remember? It's marginal resource cost, okay. So MC in labor market is MRC, marginal resource cost. What is MB, what is marginal benefit known as? It's known as MRP, or Marginal Revenue Product of Labor. We've seen that before, right? We just defined that, okay? Now, guess what? The way we, pro we maximize profit in the labor market is the same thing as we've done before, right? Before we said marginal cost equals marginal benefit, and our profit is maximized. The labor market, it's marginal revenue, resource cost, excuse me, if marginal resource cost is equivalent to the marginal revenue product of labor, okay, then we have maximized the profit, okay? So, all right, so, so how can firms use this and kind of understand how to hire people? Well, the point is that if a firm is wanting to hire, well, should we hire five people, 10 people, 12 people? What they need to calculate is the marginal resource cost and the marginal revenue product of labor, and they can get an answer to that, okay? So um, that's, that's, you basically hire to the point where this is equal to that, all right? Moving on, uh, we're gonna come into how um, this actually works in the real world, okay? Because here's the point, we've always said that MR equals P, right? We've always said marginal um, uh, revenue equals price. Unfortunately, in the real world, it doesn't work that way, okay? This is, this is more theoretical. Um, in the real world, it, it, it works as so. The marginal revenue, okay, is actually greater than the price, okay? This is how it works in the real world. Unfortunately, in competitive markets that we put on, and we've talked about before, marginal revenue is equal to price. Keep that in mind. We're going to come back to this a little bit more later, okay? For now, what we're going to talk about is this marginal revenue product of labor. This class is going to nail out marginal revenue product of labor, okay? Saying those words is just so difficult, okay? But anyways, we'll say, call it, we'll say MRP for now, okay? Let me graph MRP, okay? For those of you who are visual learners, it's going to be a little more helpful if we graph it out, okay? The way MRP works is each firm, right, has its own marginal revenue product of labor. Now, if you take the sum, right, this, this little um, alphabet is a sum, right, the Greek alphabet, okay? If it's sum of MRPL, right, so if you take the sum of all the different MRPLs in the, in the market, you get the demand for labor, okay? Demand for labor. And this kind of looks like any other demand graph we've done before in the past, okay? It's downward sloping, right? And it kind of looks like that. So this basically says that this is the sum of MRPL, right? 
or is equivalent to the demand of labor. All right. So what goes on the uh, the x-axis is Q labor. Okay, again. So how many people am I hiring? This could be doctors, nurses, engineers. Okay, and this is dollars. And this is basically what is this? If you go right here, right, and we take a point. Okay, let's say I hire X amount of people at this point. I pay this amount of wage. Okay, so this is going to be wage on the left. On the right is going to be Q labor. Okay, and this could be anybody you're empl employing at that point in time. All right, so in a competitive market, MRPL forms the demand of labor and the wage forms the supply, okay? So the way we form supplies is kind of horizontal line this way, right? And wage gives you your supply. And where those two meet is your equilibrium, okay? So that's the way it's gonna work. Um, now, what we're gonna dig into after this point, remember this graph though because it's it might show up on an AP test. Um, so just spend some time and try to understand MRPL in more uh, depth. For now, I'm gonna shift gears and talk a little bit more about this concept called derived demand. Okay, what is derived demand? Derived demand basically discusses a very simple concept. It says that an input, like labor, right, derives its demand from the product demand. Okay, so how does that work? Um, let's write it down and we can talk about it. So if you think about M&Ms, okay, I don't know what your favorite candy is, it could be Kit Kat, it could be m and it could be whatever, all right? Let's say for some reason the entire world loves M&Ms, okay, which it does, it's a great candy, okay? People all of a sudden don't consume anything else and they love m and okay? All the other candy goes away. What's going to happen is that the demand for M&Ms is going to skyrocket, right? It's going to skyrocket, right? So the demand for M&Ms is gonna go up, okay? Up as in going up, right? It's, it's increasing, right? So what does this do? What does this do if the demand for M&Ms goes up? If this goes up, right, what's gonna happen is the people who make M&Ms are gonna say, hey, you know what? Everybody loves M&Ms. Even if we charge a little more for M&Ms, they're still gonna consume M&Ms, right? So what they're gonna do is the price of the product is gonna go up, okay? And if the price of the product goes up, Remember, I told you guys that MRPL, that marginal revenue product of labor, right, is broken down into a couple things, and price is one of the factors for MRPL. So the amount of money they make is going to go up. So guess what? The MRPL actually goes up. Okay? Now, if the MRPL goes up, right, and, and the firms are having more revenue per the product of labor, right, because of this excess money, what's going to actually happen is that they're gonna hire more people, right? Hire more people, okay? Because the excess money that they get from these profits, right, is gonna go into labor. Okay, why can't they use it for themselves? Because the point is that they wanna keep riding on this demand, okay? So they're gonna hire more people, create more M&Ms, so they can make more money. Because understand that the demand has gone up, okay? And this is this concept called derived demand, okay? Derived demand. It might again show up on a test, okay? So understand the concept of der derived demand. It basically says that an input like labor, okay? Input like labor can be derived from the goods demand, okay? From the goods demand. All right, so um, real quick, how can we graph derived demand? All right, let's... Um, Look at uh, the previous graph that we did about 30 seconds ago, right? On the y-axis was this dollars, right? Remember, it was wage, okay? On the right was Q labor, okay? Right? And we had a downward sloping MRPL, okay? Remember in the competitive market, right? MRPL is also the demand for labor, right? So MRPL, okay? And you have a particular point in wage, okay? Let's say that they're paying, I don't know, they're paying $5, okay? And they're hiring five workers, all right? So the demand for, for M&Ms has gone up, the price of M&Ms has gone up, the MRPL goes up, okay? If the MRPL goes up, the way we write it in the graph is we shift it to the right, all right? So we're gonna put, always use two arrows, okay, when you shift lines, 
to the right is up. Okay, so when something goes up, you shift it to the right, right? Something goes down, shift to the left, okay? So shift to the right this time, right? And we have a new MRPL. Let's call this MRPL1, okay? And if you look, right, in the same wage, right, wages are not going to change, okay? Understand that. If you go and look to the right, you all of a sudden can hire more people, right? Let's say this is 10. So your Q labor has gone up, right? And that's how you show graphically that you hire more people. But logically understand why are we hiring more people? Well, we want to ride on this demand, make more profits, and create more M&Ms, right? So that we make more money. That's why they're going to hire more people, okay? So understand that that's the concept behind derived demand. But in general, okay, I, I get it. I get the, you know, the whole demand thing, right? And you're going, what else can drive demand, right? What basically are the factors that determine demand, all right? And that's what we're going to get into right now, okay? So on to the left-hand side of the board. Let's uh, look at what are the different um, things. So first of all, we've already talked about this a little bit before, right? We've talked about product demand, okay? Product demand. Pretty straightforward, right? If your product is demanded more, right, the demand in general for labor is going to go up, right? Because you want to need more people, you want to make more money, and that's how things work. Product demand, pretty straightforward. All right, next thing we're talking about is productivity, okay? Productivity. Productivity. Okay? And productivity, as it turns out, breaks down into three different things, okay? The first is the uh, technical progress, okay, so technology, okay, short as tech. Second, the quantity of variable resources, okay, variable resources, right, and the quantity of, let's say, others for now, okay, others. All right, so what is this? First is technology. All right, so Understand this, it's pretty simple and straightforward. If you're technologically more savvy, right, all of a sudden we get, you know, a lot more machines that are a lot more complex and all of a sudden instead of making five bags per second, we make 10 bags per second. Obviously, that's going to drive my productivity, right? I'm much more productive in making these M&Ms, okay? And that basically says that I can serve these people more M&Ms and out of that in turn, I make more money per day on these M&Ms. So that's how we can drive feed demand and determine demand, right? Productivity. Second is the quantity of variable resources. All right, let's say that in my factory, right, instead of hiring middle schoolers, right, I hire PhDs. Now, okay, maybe that's, that's a quite varied example. Instead of, uh, let's say, high school students, I hire, I hire college students, right? So maybe, right, with the extra amount of education and training, these people can think better, right, and they can produce more M&Ms per day, all right? Again, that increases my productivity. Let's talk about other resources, right? So let's say that our machines, or, or you know, for what, for what reason, uh, you know, we talked about this a little before in technology, but let's say our machines, right, other resources, again, become better, right? We, again, become more productive, okay? So understand that resources, right, and productivity, like productivity is huge when it comes to anything, microeconomics, macroeconomics, understand productivity is huge because we can, we can do a lot more things and we're a lot more productive. And normally speaking, technology is the key factor that drives these, these um, innovations in productivity, okay? Um, the last one we're gonna talk about is the prices of other resources, okay? Prices, right, a little bigger because we're getting on the bottom of it, but prices of um, other resources. All right, let's talk about this a little bit. Other resources, okay. RES for short, resources. All right, so what about this, price of other resources? All right, let's say I'm making these M&Ms, right? And I have all these machines in my factory, okay? And all of a sudden, machines become a lot cheaper, okay? Machines become a lot cheaper. What's gonna happen is that me as the owner of this peanut M&M factory, right? I'm gonna say that I'm gonna take in more machines because they're cheaper and I'm gonna replace them, unfortunately, with labor, okay? Because these machines are cheaper than labor and they make more, more things. So obviously, the machine is the more economically right decision, right? So I take more, uh, more machines, right? So what happens is that there's a substitution effect, okay? okay I'll show it for sub, but no, this is like, one of the main things is substitution effect. So why is this happening? Because machines are cheaper, unfortunately, than labor. 
I'm going to have to replace the labor with machines, okay? Now, that being said, there is good news, right? Apart from the substitution effect, there's also what we call the output effect, okay? Output effect. And how is output effect important? Well, let's say that I've taken these machines and I've replaced, I've taken some labor out, okay, and I've replaced them with machines. Now, all of a sudden, they're more productive, right? Again, we're going to get back in this loop of productivity creates more profits, okay? Profits create more need for us to create more product, okay? And that product is going to be driven by how? More labor, okay? So the output effect is going to bring in more labor because this increased productivity is bringing us more money. We want to make more money in the future, so we're going to hire more people, okay? So what that's going to happen is the output effect is going to make us hire people. So basically what happens is a net effect between the substitute effect and the output effect is what determines is are you hiring people or firing people, okay? So that's the main difference, all right? The last other thing we, we could talk about real quick uh, when it comes to uh, what determines demand is the complementary resources. Say I'm making, you know, M&Ms, right? And let's say I'm making peanut M&Ms and the cost of peanuts go down by a lot, drastically. What's gonna happen is that with that extra money that I save on peanuts, right? I could use that on labor. So what happens is the price of complementary resources oftentimes dictates if I, can, if I can hire more labor or subtract labor, okay? So at this point in time, we've talked a little bit about labor. Um, so we're gonna talk about hiring a little more, okay? It's um, economies are not doing great, so let's talk about hiring, all right? So how does, how does hiring work? Let's use this side of the board and we'll talk about hiring. Economically speaking, right, economists like to come up with solutions to saying what is the right answer. There's no gray area, right? So they came up with this least cost hiring rule, okay? Least, sort of makes sense, right? Least cost hiring rule, okay? Uh, hiring. Okay, what is this least cost hiring rule? Okay, so least cost hiring rule basically says I have two main steps, all right? So let's start with the first one, okay? The first one says that you must produce Q units. So, we're, well, let's stick to this M&M example, okay? Um, you must, okay, make, make Q units. What does that say? All right, what does that say? Um, I'm basically saying that for this year, okay, I've calculated using whatever calculations, right? I've said that I need to make a million bags of M&Ms, okay? So we've come up, we've come up with this Q units of M&Ms, okay? We, we, have, we have to make, this year, we have to make a million bags of M&Ms. All right, so to find, um, to make those million bags of M&Ms, we must find the total cost, all right? So find the total cost, right? Okay, so to make a million bags of M&Ms, it's gonna cost us a million dollars, all right? So we've pretty much found out that it's cost a million dollars to make these million bags of M&Ms at this point in time. All right, so what you do is, you take this total cost of a million dollars, okay? And then you say, if you have to spend a million dollars, if you spend TC, okay? TC, if you spend TC, again, TC star, if you spend TC star, if you spend this million dollars, right, what is the max amount I can make? What is the max Q I can make? You see that transition? Basically we say we have to make a, a million bags, all right, perfect, and to make a million bags at the point in time, we calculate that we take a million dollars. Now using that million dollars, right, what we're gonna say is, what's the max we can use? Maybe we can produce even more than a million, right? Maybe we can produce a million and a hundred thousand, right? So calculating that basically says, how can I maximize my quantity given the amount of money I'm spending on this, okay? So this is about spending the least amount of money, but having the most amount of output, okay? So how is that gonna break down? Again, mathematically speaking, everything breaks down mathematically, right? So I'm gonna switch over here and write down the formula for the least cost rule, okay? So the least cost rule um, says the following, okay? It's pretty straightforward. 
and it's similar to what we've seen before. The least cost rule, uh, the formula boils down to this. The marginal product of labor, something you've seen before, over the price of labor, okay, must be equal to the marginal product of capital over the price of capital, okay? Or another way of putting at it is if marginal product of labor over marginal product of capital should be equivalent to the price of labor over the price of capital, okay? If this is true, you're using the least amount of cost and you're getting the max amount of output, all right? If this is true, least amount of cost, max amount of output. All right, so what if, right, I'm, I'm making these M&Ms and I calculate this, this figure, right? Calculate M MPL and I calculate PL, PK, all these, all right, fine. And what happens is that I find out that my marginal product of labor is greater than my, than my, this side is greater than that side, right? MPL over PL is greater than MPK over PK. What does that mean? It basically says that I need to spend more money on labor because I'm getting max, maximum um, output and revenue out of labor at this point, okay? Now what if this arrow is the other way, right? My marginal product of capital over price of capital is greater than the other side. Well, you need to spend more money on the capital side because that is what's being more efficient right now, okay? So basically you need to work, you as a firm owner need to work out this equation until these two are equivalent to each other, okay? And then you've officially and efficiently made the least cost possible, okay? Least cost rule, all right? You might see this again in charts and the question on the, on the test, so go ahead and plug this in and you should be able to get the answer, all right? So the last bit we're gonna talk about and the way we're gonna end this lesson is with the, with the concept that we've seen before, right? And we're gonna use this side here, saying what is the law of supply? Now, you've probably seen this before, but we're gonna try to apply the law of supply to the labor market, okay? Um, so the law of supply, all right, says that if a price of a good, right, P of good goes up, right, price of good goes up, let's say price of M&M has gone up, okay, it says that the supplier, right, supplier, supplier is gonna increase the Q of that good, okay? Now, why would he do that? Pretty straightforward, right? If he knows that the price is going up, right? He knows the demand is going up, right? And so he wants to make more money and more profits out of it. So he's gonna increase the amount of um, M&Ms he makes so that he can capitalize and make more profits, right? Remember that revenue breaks down into price times quantity, okay? So if my price is going up, great, I'm making a lot of money. Now imagine if my Q also goes up, a lot of money, right? So that's the law of supply. Now, how do we show this graphically, okay? So that, that graph again that we've been using, right? You have dollars, right, as wage on the y-axis. On the x-axis, you have Q, labor, all right? And you have the labor demand and the labor supply, okay? So you have supply here, right? You have labor demand here. Now, what if my demand shifts to the right? Watch this. My demand shifts to the right, okay, I'll call this LD1, okay? Before, I used to hire maybe, let's say, five workers, right? And again, I was paying $5. If the demand for labor goes up, and remember that derived demand concept where the product price is going up, right? I can, my MRPL goes up. If my MRPL goes up, I can hire more people, right? So if this whole demand is shifting to the right, I hire more people, but at the same time, I pay them a higher wage. I pay them a higher wage, okay? So what is important off of this concept is that if my price of my good is going up, the supplier is shifting the, the quantity of goods available in the market, the wage is also gonna go up and the quantity of workers is also gonna go up, okay? So that is basically the um, principle behind this. So I wanna recap before we start jumping into new topics in the next lesson, real quick about what we went over. Um, one of the main topics today that we covered is a marginal revenue product of labor. I know it's not 
the most interesting stuff in the world, but uh, important because you get to understand why workers are hired and some workers aren't, right? So why does a company fire people? Why does a company hire people? It's based on the fact that, well, how much money are they making me, right? And um, how much resources uh, they're taking up, okay? So understand that. Next lesson, we're gonna jump in to um, things such as monopsony. What if you actually have more market power? Remember, I talked a little bit about what happens in the real world, and we're gonna see that in the next lesson. And what's gonna happen graphically is we're gonna show you how basically if you have more uh, market power as a firm, what you get to do is that you get to basically pay less for the same amount in a com in competitive market, but that'll be more clear in the next lesson. For now, just remember concepts like derived demand, okay? This probably will show up on a test, okay? Understand that derived demand basically says that an input like labor, okay, is derived from the product's demand, okay? So the demand for the input labor is derived from the product's demand, okay? So derived demand was important. Um, how do you basically profit maximize in a labor market? MRP equals MRC, right? And least cost rule, right? What is the least cost rule? My MPL over PL should be equal to the MPC over PC. All right, so that being said, let's um, go over the uh, homework question. Homework question, I think the most important concept in this, in this lesson is derived demand. So uh, define me derived demand. Now define me derived demand using a flow chart. Okay, so when I say D goes up, then my P goes up, and so on and so forth. So use a flow chart and explain me the derived demand concept. I'll be seeing you guys in the next lesson. Thank you so much for tuning in.